tell me about the Prisoner of Turan. Tell me how that started. Prisoner of Turan. I read a book um, uh, by the na- by that name by Marina Namad, mm-hmm. a magnificent woman mm-hmm. that Canada is lucky to have, mm-hmm. and it was given me by Monica Estevez when I was the interim artistic director of Nightmare Theatre. When I read that book, I just gasped and probably gasped out loud um, at the story of Marina when she was thrown into prison and tortured as a teenager in Iran. She was thrown into the famous uh, bin prison. They were throwing a lot of the high school kids and the teenagers into prison because the teenagers didn't, didn't know any better. They were like marching and they were doing peaceful marching and calling for a change to the, to the governments um, and for a better education because the government of Ayatollah Khomeini was really doing repressive education or lack of education. Um, so she was thrown in prison and couldn't believe that she would be thrown in prison because she wasn't a violent revolutionary. Right? Um, and she was forced to, to, marry her, um, to, to marry her torture actually, and, and, and he under threat that her, her family would be in danger. And, and so. um, but what I gasped at when I read the book was this: her best friend, Sarah, in prison, lost her brother. Her brother was executed. And Sarah, in her grief, began to write her entire life story over her own body. And these two girls in the showers, with, naked under the showers, with this girl just g- g- grieving for the, her life, her brother, the death of her brother, and having her life story washed off her body because she had, she couldn't not get washed. She had to get clean. And Marina promising her that she would help her write again, write the story again on her back. And I just thought, this is so much about friendship and youth. It's about, it's about the life force of young people and hope in the face of a repressive regime. How can this maybe be turned into a play? Mm-hmm. And it can't be done in a naturalistic, realistic way. There's no way you can do that. I have to find a multiple character way of doing it, not unlike the solo show, but with three actors maybe or something like that. So I began to write the play with Marina as my guide. And she's a poet herself. And I said, Marina, I need to write imaginary scenes. And she said, yes, I know. I know how that works. It's okay. Write an imaginary scene. Um, I understand what it takes to write a play, and that's the way she was with me all throughout, giving correction and all the rest of it. And what I think was kind of exciting was that it was my company, the Contrary Company, that ended up producing it um, in association with Theatre Pasmarai, and we had victims of torture that were promoting their cause um, in the lobby. We had people who, who themselves had come from incredible, devastating backgrounds coming to see the play, and theatre lovers coming to see how this could all be done. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the theatre was packed every night, and, and, and I thought, how wonderful, because this is like torture. People are coming, they're paying for a ticket, and they're going to be seeing some torture. But of course, we didn't do it naturalistically. Mm-hmm. We kept lifting it up into Marina's love of poetry. Her love of poetry was the motor that I wanted. So I wove that poetry through, her, her own poetry as well as other poetry, through the play and tried to bring a kind of an inspirational, um, poetic creativity rather than just sturdy girl fights against, you know, her terrible situation. Right. You know, I tried to bring a poetic... Um, uh, it's very different from any play that I've written and probably any play I'll write again. And I, I kind of love that. Wow! Can I be a playwright that you didn't, you wouldn't, or you wouldn't know who wrote that? Mm-hmm. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. So. How do you approach adaptation? How do you approach somebody? Else I read, that? I read the book um, thoroughly two or three times. Then I got a, a notebook and started from the in perspective of so uh, all the key characters. I filled an entire notebook, writing by hand the entire story from the perspective of her torturer, mm-hmm. from the perspective of her mother from the perspective of her best friend. So the story from these different perspectives Mm -hmm. until I was able to understand every one of these people like the back of my hand. Mm -hmm. Then I dared to start writing the play itself. Hmm. How do you approach um, outlining and structuring? Is that important to your process or do you just start on page one? Not at all. Okay. I'm very worried about outlines because nobody's ever asked me to write one yet and I'm hoping nobody ever will. <laughs> I believe that structure mm-hmm. and plot mm-hmm. are the thing that happens when your characters get into trouble. Mm-hmm. I believe that a play is trouble mm-hmm. 
and it gives the illusion that it's happening right now. We all agree on the illusion that it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. That's what that's all a play is. Mm -hmm. And plot and structure are actually how, if I really trust my people in my play, mm -hmm. they will try to survive in a certain way mm -hmm. with and against each other and structure will evolve. Right. And then how do you deal with uh, rewriting? What's your approach to rewriting? Um, I love it. I mean, I, you know, as long as I'm happy with my play. I have one play that's been sitting in my gathering dust that makes me really sad because I'm not quite sure what's wrong with it. But there's something wrong with it. Anyway, oh, yeah. um, so I sort of look at it every now and then and go, it's that bad. Oh, look at it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I get terribly enthused by the feedback that I receive. I'm very careful whom mm -hmm. to receive feedback from. Mm -hmm. Fabulous actors being, you know, and very, very trusted guides, mm -hmm. whoever they may be, yeah. you know. Um, but I can't. But you know, if somebody out there, because now I'm getting, I'm starting to get some money for for my play about the breast cancer uh, mm -hmm. clinical trial, and along with money are suggestions. Oh, we should have a dramaturgical session together sometime. And I sort of go, okay, but I may have to go la 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 la, yeah. <laughs> because I know I'm. Fo how old am I? I'm going to say I'm 42 years old. I'm, actually, no, I'm 63. That was it. Um, um, I'm 63, so I get a sense of what kind of what kind of feedback back is good for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what kind of feedback is good for you? What do you? Who do you look for as your first sort of point of reference for when you when you launch your play out there into the world? What kind of what kind of um, soul are you looking for? I'm looking for believers. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for people that step into the believing world when they read my play back to me. Mm -hmm. So I like I like to get actors as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And I like the actors that are, they don't have to worry about their acting. Don't worry about your acting and don't worry about how clever you have to be about the play. Mm -hmm. Please just find out to what extent you can thoroughly believe what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, they can actually share that experience with me. Mm -hmm. You know, they can. They can say, I, I never, you know, like, I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble feeling the life force of this character. Um, it's great, it's strong here, it's weak here. I mean, actors are wonderful that way, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I think what I need is a, a dramaturgical person who can imagine the production. Yeah. What's the point of dramaturgy? Like, in the, like, dramaturges at their worst are middle management in the theatre that never have to take responsibility for their work. Mm -hmm. At their worst. Mm -hmm. At their best, they are imagining a production. Mm -hmm. Do you find uh, working with directors as dramaturges uh, helps? Do you find that? Yes, I think a director dramaturge is often your best dramaturge. Mm -hmm. I did an awful lot. I didn't even know I was doing it. But when I commissioned people at YPT and tried to bring the plays to the stage, mm -hmm. I was then working with the playwright mm -hmm. on very practical details about the life force of the play. Mm -hmm. Because we were going to meet an audience together. Of course. Now, tell me about... Um, well, we'll talk about The Cure for Everything, and then we'll talk about your new play. So, The Cure for Everything, how is that? Where did that come from? Uh, I knew that Elsa had to grow up. Elsa was 11 when we left her and uh, You Fancy Yourself, that first play. Mm -hmm. And I knew she had to grow up. And I wondered um, what... I, I went back to my own life, because it is shadowing my life to a certain extent. What was, what was the most devastating or frightening, or what were the, what were the most landmark moments in my teenagehood. Mm -hmm. One of them was the um, unbelievable anticlimax of losing my virginity. But then I don't know whether I got it. Yeah, I mean, it, was just, it seemed like, a, anyway, whatever. <laughs> One of them was the that. The look on your face was priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Which you have um, to see the play now to understand <laughs> why she had that look on her face. The other one was that I thought the world was going to end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we all go through, as children, we worry about our parents disappearing and dying or whatever. Mm -hmm. But one day I came, I came home, and my parents were, and, and, and mum was at the kitchen, and she's usually the person who chats with me about this and that. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, we could have a, a, bit, a third world war. I said, what? She says, President Kennedy is, is uh, now start, starting to uh, mm -hmm. suggest war to the Russians. Mm -hmm. to Khrushchev. And uh, this was the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. And my parents, who were very worldly and sort of aware of what happens in the world, like all Icelandic people are, 
um, they were scared. I could, I, it wasn't even the, the information I was getting, it was the fear that I felt from them, right? So um, I thought of that, and I thought, what if Elsa, what if Elsa is desperate to try to get, you know, all this, everything into place, as you know, planning her teenage years, as she does, planning her life and her imagination, and, you know, she also makes things up and then tries to live it. Mm -hmm. Nothing like me, of course. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, what if Elsa discovers that the world could end any minute? What is she going to do about her life? So let's find out what her life is like. And, of course, um, I also had other favorite moments, like how much um, I loved my Beatles uh, 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 tights, you know, we, we had tights with big, huge, horrible beetles all over them to celebrate the fact that we loved the beetles. And, and it was 1962, and um, Love Me Do had uh, hit the chart, so, you know, so I sort of crammed a lot of my sort of memorable moments around Elsa to find out what, um, what she would do about her life. And of course, when she finds out the world could end any minute, Mm -hmm. um, she th realizes she has to live her life as fast as she can, so she has to uh, get drunk, lose her virginity, um, uh, have a baby and become famous. Mm -hmm. Or maybe become famous before having the baby. She hasn't quite got to that yet. Mm -hmm. So Elsa, at, at, at exactly that same point, a girl, a very worldly girl, starts to become friends with Elsa. Mm -hmm. And this worldly girl invites Elsa into the seedy side of life far too young for her age. Elsa is only 14, but she discovers drunkenness mm -hmm. and actually adores it, loves it once mm -hmm. more. She discovers the danger of sexuality and then she discovers the anticlimax of sexuality. Mm -hmm. Part of me also wanted to say, hey, come on guys, the 60s, the beginning of the 60s, uh, free love, all this kind of stuff. It wasn't really like that. Mm -hmm. Free love kind of, in many ways, it was like boys getting it for free. Yeah. You know, there was, there was quite a lot of downsides. A lot of that stuff had a bit of a downside. So I was exploring the underbelly, the mm -hmm. disappointments and the hazards of sexuality at the same time. And uh, every writer, of course, takes from their life and every writer uses stuff from, from, from their past. But did you feel like um, this... Uh, did you feel uh, that this was closely tied to what you, what you experienced uh, growing up, or did you did you take flights of fancy and just really expand on it? Was it, it was it, I cherry picked. Mm -hmm. I cherry picked and I compressed. Mm -hmm. um, I actually found my teenagehood. Although there are other people who knew me as teenagers who I still know, and they said you were a cute little darling and you were like just the you know the action-packed, fun-loving gal. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that. I remember the pains and the awkwardnesses and the difficulties. I remember the um, first time, uh, uh, the first time I. Well, not the first time, but I remember going going out with people and getting drunk, but it actually turning and not being as much fun anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I remember trying to be fabulous, but always knowing there was somebody else more fabulous than me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, so in a funny kind of a way, I, but I also was oh, clearly, you know, I mean, I actually like being older. I've mm -hmm. always thought getting older was like, you know, quite a stabilizing thing that happened mm -hmm. to people. Yeah. Um, but I think probably that's universal. You know, I everybody, the, most a lot of people that were told they were, oh, you were the cool one of the cool kids in school. You go, I was. How come I didn't know that? <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so there's a self deception and an illusion thing that I love exploring as a playwright, uh -huh. and that was very much to do with myself. Was there a real Brian Baxter, or is that a made up name? Was there? He's built upon um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of a comp. He's a composite, a composite. actually. Yes, mm -hmm. um, I adored him. I mean, I kind of invented him pretty well, um, and I'm, I'm glad I invented him actually. Mm -hmm. But he was definitely a composite of some of the some of the nicer boys I knew. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and yeah, yeah. And sometimes, I, you know, something. Sometimes my fictional characters that I really make up mm -hmm. are actually better characters than some of the ones that are closer to. Mm -hmm. Real people, I have to, you know, it's kind of a strange mm -hmm. thing for us writers. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'd love to know more about the not so nice boys that you knew, but maybe we'll talk about that later. Oh, yeah, I've got some stories, but they're horror stories, so I'll talk mm -hmm. later. <laughs> we'll talk later, yeah.